Today on The Divide, a new twist in the battle over a mayor's missing messages. What we need to do is fix it, not fight about what didn't work, but how do we make it better? Also, a return to in-person briefings, what an easing of virtual press conferences actually means for you. And when we return to the in-person press conference, it's gonna be a, a lot, lot more helpful for us to be able to interject right at that moment before they move on to the next reporter. Plus, it's become a familiar tactic from the governor. You are a bioreactor facility generating virus. But does shaming people really change their behavior? That and more as we attempt to bridge the divide. Hello and welcome to The Divide. Thank you so much for joining us. There were some interesting storylines this week involving the press, and that's where we begin today. The Seattle Times with this head-scratching headline. City denies wrongdoing alleged in public records lawsuit countersues the Seattle Times. Yes, you heard me read that correctly. The city is countersuing a news agency. To catch some of you up here, the Times sued the city over months of missing messages from Mayor Jenny Durkin, the fire chief, and former police chief Carmen Best, all of whom are mysteriously missing messages from the period during Seattle's autonomous, autonomous experiment known as CHOP. Given the seriousness of what went down on Seattle's Capitol Hill for a month last summer, news agencies sought to put the pieces together through public disclosure requests. Reporters wanted to find out, in part, whose decision it was to abandon the police department's East Precinct and let the area be taken over, leading, of course, to violence and deaths. But the media was absolutely beside itself when it was revealed that the mayor's text messages were missing, vanished, as were the messages of other top safety officials, all from that critical time frame. While quite suspicious, Mayor Durkin denied any wrongdoing. Was it intentional? No. What happened? I think it's, first, I think it's really important that people know that I take this super seriously. And it's one reason why we're working really hard to, the good thing with digital communications is, there's multiple copies places. So we're trying to find every copy of everyone that's missing. What happened to your text so, messages? Based on what I've been told, um, the, you know, I had three phones during this period of time. And sometime during that period of time, one of the phones was set to a retention period of 30 days. Um, that's been corrected, it's for forever. But her promise that this wasn't done intentionally did not stop the Seattle Times from suing over it, arguing that the city violated open records laws by failing to inform reporters that the missing messages were, in fact, missing. So why should you care about all of this? Well, this is how we get information to you. Often when politicians aren't being transparent about their activities, which, yes, happens quite a bit, it is these public records that help us paint a more complete picture. And when those records go missing... Well, someone needs to be held accountable for that, which makes this latest twist in the story all the more bizarre. Let's go back to that Seattle Times headline for a moment. City denies wrongdoing alleged in public records lawsuit countersues the Seattle Times. Just so we're clear, the city's response to the Seattle Times suing over the missing messages was to sue them back. It's just it's overall just not a great look. The Times writing in this article, although it concedes the mayor's texts are lost, the city's response filed in King County Superior Court includes a counterclaim against the newspaper and seeks a legal judgment that it complied with all relevant provisions of the Public Records Act. So in short, the city admits the messages are indeed lost, but doesn't believe it actually violated any law in how it handled the situation. So it wants a, a judge to rule as much. A spokesperson for the city attorney's office claims its countersuit does not, it, it, it claims its countersuit is harmless, essentially, that it doesn't seek any damages from the Times. Dan Nolte writing us in an email, it is in everyone's interest to have a judge clarify the law, which is the purpose of the counterclaim. To be clear, the city is not and will not seek any monetary damages, findings of wrongdoing, injunctive relief, or attorney's fees from or against the plaintiff. The plaintiff, of course, the Seattle Times. But Michelle Matassa Flores, the executive editor of the Times, is not willing to take the city's word for it. She told me in an email, well, we appreciate the city's informal pledge not to seek money or an injunction. The fact remains that its answer, the official court record in this case, 
asks the city, the court, to award costs and attorney fees to the city. It also reserves the right to file third-party lawsuits against us in the future to get an injunction against disclosure. If Mr. Nolte is serious, why doesn't he simply amend the city's legal filing? So whether they want to do that and make some sort of official agreement that the city is not going to collect damages from the newspaper, I mean, I guess that's their business in part. But the fact that this countersuit is happening in the first place and, and that the city is suing a news agency over public records, it just isn't a good look, especially when admittedly the city screwed up royally when it came to retaining messages from a critically important period of time. I spoke to Mayor Jenny Durkin about the optics of this entire situation. Do the optics of that just look bad? So Brandy, the first I heard about it was when I read about it in the paper. Um, as you know, the city attorney is a separately elected official. He's in charge of supervising the litigation and makes assessments on how to defend litigation against the city. Um, and I think that the, you know, in every lawsuit we have, um, the city has an obligation to respond to it. And he made the judgment that that's how to respond. But I think the important thing is, is not what happens in litigation. What happens, what the important thing is, what are we doing to make it better? Um, and I, the week before, that same week, earlier in the week, I issued a directive to do a number of concrete things to improve um, citywide responses to a Public Records Act, because the city is facing, you know, challenges we've never had before with the amount of digital information. But there's a greater need for the public to know what's going on. Um, and for the first time ever, we're going to uh, include an outside advisory group of media, transparency experts, public records experts, so they can in real time advise us on whether our policies and procedures are working or whether we need to change things. So I'm gonna be really focused on what are the structural things we can do to improve it and, and not just get caught up in you know, the controversies on litigation because litigation is never gonna fix what we need to fix. I just want to have you react to uh, a quote from the executive editor of the Times. She said in part, um, in reaction to sort of the countersuit and the headline, um, we're extremely surprised and disappointed at the extent of the denial shown in this countersuit. What will it take for the mayor and her staff to give more than lip service to transparency and the importance of independent journalism? What do you say to the executive editor of the Times? So I think that, um, that if they had asked the right questions, they assumed that we had helped make the decision to file that, um, which was not true. Um, and we had been working with the reporters earlier in the week to try to get more information about the positive changes we're making, including, including media um, uh, members and transparency in an oversight group, as well as really concrete things to improve it. So I, I don't think a back and forth. I think that, you know, as you know, press works under deadlines sometimes. I wish they had called us first. Um, but uh, the important thing is what we need to do is fix it, not fight about what didn't work, but how do we make it better? Yeah, fix it, but that wouldn't be uh, enough to get back the messages that are already missing. And so the question is, should somebody be held accountable for that? So we're going to continue to track uh, this lawsuit from the Times, the counter lawsuit the city filed against the Times, what all that means. And again, remember, this is a lawsuit that they filed really on your behalf to make sure that when the media requests something that the public is entitled to, it gets it. So this stuff is really important. All right, uh, moving on, and again, I told you we're gonna talk a lot about the media today. Uh, another story involving the local media, we're about two weeks out, as you know, from a really important primary election, and the endorsements are starting to drop. In the Seattle area, two of the most sought after endorsements are that of the Seattle Times and The Stranger. The problem is that those endorsements uh, often kind of uh, involve candidates that I would say are completely antithetical to each other. For example, in the race for uh, King County Executive, or no, the mayor, in the race for mayor, let's take a look at this. Uh, the Seattle Times is endorsing Bruce Harrell, one of the more moderates in the race, I would say. The stranger, on the other hand, is endorsing Council President Lorena Gonzalez, a progressive who supported defunding police. The race for King County Executive, the Times endorsing the incumbent, Dow Constantine, the stranger endorsing his slightly more progressive opponent, State Senator Joe Wynn. Uh, let's take a look at the two Seattle City Council races. In the race for citywide Seattle City City Council seat number nine. The Times endorsing business owner Sarah Nelson. The Stranger endorsing police abolitionist Nikita Oliver. Two very different candidates. <laughs> this one cracked me up. 
uh, race for city council position eight. The Times didn't endorse anyone. <laughs> they don't think anyone who's running is worthy of the job. The stranger, on the other hand, endorsing the incumbent progressive Teresa Mosqueda. And, you know, that had me wondering. Two, two endorsements people really want in politics in the city. Um, completely opposites. So, you know, are they kind of canceling each other out here? And I really wanted to know, like, how much do endorsements matter to you, the voter? I asked you guys in a Twitter poll uh, about how much you consider a candidate's various endorsements when deciding who to vote for. The overwhelming majority, about 70 percent, said not at all. A uh, few of you said a lot. Um, an another big chunk of you said somewhat. Uh, let me get to some of your responses here. All right, on Twitter. It depends. If the stranger or the urbanist endorse someone, I'm definitely not voting for them. So like opposite endorsement, looking for what endorsements to avoid. I gotcha. Susan says, it depends on who is endorsing and if I'm confident they're an entity that does proper vetting. I realize it's subjective, but so much of deciding on a candidate is subjective unless they are an incumbent and have a record. That's true. Uh, Matthew, depends. Sometimes there isn't enough information out there. Endorsements by those I trust or respect can help put a candidate over the top. Let's see. Uh, Andy, endorsements can tell you a lot about a person and how they lean. Look at Harold versus Gonzalez. His endorsements are mostly moderate groups and people, while Gonzalez is getting endorsements from the Sawant crowd. Do we have another one here? Is this the last one? Greg, for me, they mean nothing. I prefer to hear things straight from the proverbial horse's mouth on matters that would afford a preview of how they'd conduct themselves in office and what they'd go to bat for. So I think we all have different ways where we look at races and decide, OK, uh, what am I factoring into my vote here? But whether you consider endorsements or not, remember, uh, ballots are going to be arriving in the mail soon for the primary election. So please just make sure your voice is heard. Uh, it's happening on August 3rd, so you need to get those in the mail before then. Uh, the primary obviously deciding who is going to move on to the November general election. All right, coming up, we're going to continue our theme with the press. Uh, as Jay Inslee returns to in-person briefings, what that really means for you. And later on, is shaming people into getting a vaccine an effective tactic? We discuss. Stick around. After more than a year asking questions of elected leaders from the comfort of our computers, the governor's in-person press briefings are back. Governor Inslee returning to real life reporters in his office this week, officially unable to mute us after we ask a question, thank Lord. But during the year uh, plus of uh, virtual briefings that we had, there's probably a voice, if you kind of watch them every week, there's probably a voice that you have become very accustomed to. With that, happy to stand for questions. First question comes from Rachel with AP. Up first, we'll go to Rachel LaCourt with AP. Go ahead, Rachel. First, we'll go to Rachel LaCourt with AP. Go ahead, Rachel. Hi, good morning. Governor, given the changing metrics and pauses that we've seen related to the statewide plan over these past few months, why not have everyone move into phase two? And has a decision been made yet on whether to waive the six foot rule for schools? Go ahead, Rachel. Hi, good afternoon. Governor, get a little sip of coffee there. Rachel LaCourt is the State House correspondent in Olympia for the Associated Press. Uh, she and I spoke about what was a really busy year for her. You hear a voice uh, beginning of the media questioning at every press conference the governor has and about what this return to in-person briefings actually means for you, the public. Did you ever miss a press conference? I was wondering that the other day. Have you even missed one? I think I missed one when I finally um, was able to go visit my family in Florida last month. Uh, somebody else had to cover the governor's press conference for me. So that might have been the only one I missed this session. Um, I might have missed another one in May, but no, not very many. Yeah, and I think viewers have probably become accustomed to your voice because you always have the first question of the governor. Explain to them why that is. So that is a practice that predates me by several decades um, because AP is a, um, a news cooperative. Most TV stations, radio stations, and newspapers are members of the AP. So that means they get our information and we file pretty rapidly to the, fire, uh, to the wire. So I think the idea of letting AP have the first question is so that we can get our story out immediately. And so I'm just carrying on a practice that has been in place for many, many years. So for people who don't know, we've had you on the show before uh, because you were really behind a push uh, to improve kind of our public record system and make sure we have access to all the documents that we should have. So you've been a big advocate for open government. 
Yes. To that end, you know, one of the oddest parts of these virtual uh, COVID briefings from the governor have been that you ask the question, you get muted. Uh, so for you as a journalist, just not having the opportunity in the moment to ask a follow-up question, how substantially different was that for you? Or how did it impact your reporting, if at all? Well, it was definitely a challenge. And you may have seen um, at some point you started seeing reporters asking two-part or even three-part questions um, in our one-question allotment because many of us are juggling so many stories at the same time. We really do need a lot of information. And then also having that follow-up if um, somebody does not answer your question directly is helpful. And so, but what you probably saw sometimes during those press conferences, and because I was the first question, if I didn't get the follow-up, I couldn't, I was just kind of out of luck at that point. But my colleagues were very good about asking their question, but then also being like, I'd like to go back to Rachel's question on this and really kind of have that second or third effort to get a really direct answer. But it's certainly, the, that is definitely the biggest obstacle for these remote um, press conferences, which is why when we return to the in-person press conference, it's gonna be a, a lot, lot more helpful for us to be able to interject right at that moment before they move on to the next reporter. That being said, do you have any concerns that some uh, politicians will continue sort of the virtual availabilities at, at, out of convenience or just because it's easier? I mean, I think that at the end of the day, um, these people like to be on television or they want to have reporters write on issues that they're um, pushing or bills that they've introduced. So I, I think there is a convenience to, obviously from their perspective, to have those kind of um, availabilities. But I do think everybody wants to move back into a more normal state of, of work. And I think you're seeing that with the governor's press conference this week. The Olympia Press Corps will be there in person, um, but reporters across the state who might not be able to make it to Olympia are still going to be able to call in. And I think that's a huge benefit. I think that is the one benefit that did come from this weird remote world we had to live in, is that people who normally didn't have access to a press conference that maybe is called like the day before or a few hours before, they can call in and ask a question that's really specific to their community, whether it's in Bellingham or Spokane. And I'm glad to see that that element is gonna remain as we move forward on these press conferences with the governor at least. As we kind of emerge out of hopefully the worst of it, what are your priorities in terms of areas that you wanna cover for the people of the state? Well, we have so much federal stimulus money coming into the state. So that's gonna be, I think, an important thing for us to keep track of. Where is the money going? Is it going to where it's supposed to be going? Um, is it being allocated in a timely way? We certainly saw that with the, um, the eviction um, assistance, the rental assistance. Landlords weren't getting the money um, in, in a timely way. And there was a concern about people being evicted before they even had that access to the assistance. So, and that's why we saw the bridge that was sort of extended through September. So it's, it's stories like that of just seeing how is this money being spent? How is the legislature going to respond next year on a variety of issues once we're back in person? And hopefully um, the you know, pandemic is in a different stage than, than it is now. Hopefully, uh, I agree with that a lot. Uh, as she said, you know, the pandemic might be kind of coming to an end in terms of the immediate health emergency, but there's so many impacts that will continue that we're going to need to cover for you. And being back in person with the governor uh, is going to help us do that. And speaking of the governor's return to in-person press, press briefings coming up after the break. You are a bioreactor facility. <laughs> governor Jay Hinsley. Placing blame on Trump voters for COVID cases among the unvaccinated. Is this a worthwhile tactic? We're going to discuss in my closing commentary. Stick around. I'll start this segment on vaccinations as I have others. I am fully vaccinated. I got it at the first available opportunity. And because of others who chose to do the same thing, the state this week hit a 70% vaccination rate, the rate that health experts hoped we would achieve all along. And I don't ever say, you know, 100% or something ridiculous because the reality is you're always going to have a segment of the population that does not get vaccinated. 100% vaccination isn't realistic. But Governor Jay Inslee is not content at herd immunity, and he seems to know where to place the blame for us not exceeding his expectations. You are a bioreactor facility generating virus and spreading it around, including to kids who can't get vaccinated. I want to reiterate that. If you're a 50-year-old man who you know, voted for Donald Trump and didn't think COVID was a problem and you don't get vaccinated right now, you arrest every kid in your city. 
because you could be spreading a virus to a 10-year-old who can't get eligible for the vaccine right now. Now, some of us think that's not responsible. And if that's judgmental, so be it. And look, there is some data that shows Republican-leaning areas are less vaccinated. You can see that data for yourself. Uh, this is a map from the Department of Health. Let's take a look at this. Uh, the lighter the color, the less vaccinated the population. Some counties you can see over there on the east side of the state, much lighter than on the west side. Some of those counties hovering around 30% for vaccinations. So certainly, look, it seems factual that Republican-leaning areas are less vaccinated, although there can be many factors that contribute to that, including that those areas are more rural and vaccines might not be as readily available in uh, those areas or as convenient. But all of that aside, ponder, if you will, for a moment with me, ponder, the purpose of the governor's comment. If you're a 50-year-old man who, you know, voted for Donald Trump and didn't think COVID was a problem and you don't get vaccinated right now, you arrest every kid in your city. So there can really only be two reasons the governor said what he said there. Either one, he wants to shame people who supported the former president, or two, he wants to change behavior by making people feel guilty. It's a tactic he's employed at many stages of the pandemic, like when he said this last year about teenagers continuing to party. Someone asked the other day, What's the penalty for a young person going out to a restaurant or hanging in a social get together? And it's true, the penalty is you might kill your grandparent. So when it comes to the governor's comments about Trump supporters, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's say it's not about shaming people just because they supported Trump, but rather it is his way of trying to change behaviors that he, as the governor, tasked with keeping us safe and healthy, wants to convince remaining holdouts to get a vaccine. So if we operate on that belief that that is his motivation, ask yourself, does this help accomplish that goal? You are a bioreactor facility generating virus and spreading it around, including to kids who can't get vaccinated. I want to reiterate that. If you're a 50-year-old man who, you know, voted for Donald Trump and didn't think COVID was a problem and you don't get vaccinated right now, you arrest every kid in your city because you could be spreading a virus to a 10-year-old who can't get eligible for the vaccine right now. Now, some of us think that's not responsible. And if that's judgmental, so be it. So let's say there are Trump supporters out there watching who are not vaccinated who heard that, who heard the governor speaking directly to them, calling them uh, bioreactors who are putting children at risk. If you're a 50-year-old man who, you know, voted for Donald Trump and didn't think COVID was a problem and you don't get vaccinated right now, you arrest every kid in your city. Do you believe, truly, that there is a Trump supporter on the planet who would hear Governor Inslee say that and suddenly feel compelled, feel a sudden call to duty, if you will, to get a vaccine. Not a chance. And the governor knows that. He does. So again, we go back to the only two possible reasons that the governor brought politics into the conversation to begin with. Again, one, he wanted to publicly shame Trump supporters. Or two, he was hoping he could convince them to actually get vaccinated by calling them bioreactors. As I think we all know, the latter at this stage doesn't really make any sense. People who are willing to get a vaccine, by and large, have already done so. So we're only left with option number one. That despite the fact our state is among the most vaccinated in the country, despite the fact we are fully reopened, despite the fact we hit the goal the state set for itself, the governor still feels the need to shame those who chose not to get a vaccine, but only if they also chose to support the former president. And if that's judgmental, so be it. All right, thank you so much for joining us on The Divide. If I don't say it enough, I appreciate every single one of you. Perhaps I'm feeling sentimental today. We're coming up on the two year anniversary of the show and I just wanna tell you guys, I appreciate so much uh, your viewership, your support, your feedback, the good and the bad. Till next time, see you tomorrow on Q13 News This Morning.